Chapter 5 Stranger in His Own Land It came without their asking for it, a totally different way of life, far-reaching in its influence, awful in its power, insistent in its demands. It came like a flood that nothing could stay. All in a day, it seemed it had roiled the peacefulness of the Dakota's lives, confused their minds, and given them but one choice. To conform to it, or else. And this it can force them to do, because by its very presence, it was even then making their old ways no longer feasible. Ella Deloria, Yankton, Dakota historian and anthropologist. 1944. They were advised to turn their attention to agriculture, but they were fed like paupers in a poorhouse. Samuel Pond, 1902. Teoyate Duta returned in the summer of 1858 to a changed reservation. All summer long, Brown and the farmer Dakota had been busy building houses. The banging of their hammers rang out in the air. Other houses were popping up along the eastern and southern edges of the reservation, sometimes even on reservation lands. These homes belonged to a new wave of settlers, many of them immigrants from Germany. They didn't speak English well, and few learned Dakota. The Dakota called them bad speakers. Teoyate Ruta called many of them squatters, but officials did nothing to stop those who were building their farms on Dakota lands. The leaders' frustrations grew when the payment due under the new treaty was delayed. When young Dakota men pressed Teoyate Duta for details about what the treaty had to offer, he could only point to a few presents. Congress took its time ratifying the treaty. Then all the money owed to the Bidawakatans went instead to the traders to pay off debts. Teoyate Duta had nothing to show for months of negotiations. His people felt he had let them down. As one Midewakatan later put it, Little Crow made the greatest mistake of his life when he signed this agreement. In the spring of 1859, the Midewakatan held an election for their spokesman. This person would speak for all the Midewakatan villages now gathered at Redwood Agency. Teoyate Duta lost. His world seemed to be crumbling around him. As more Midewakatans joined the farmer Dakota and built frame homes, Teoyate Duta's village shrank. Many of his friends and relatives seemed eager to join the ranks of the farmers. Teoyate Duta's influence grew smaller and smaller by the day. By the winter of 1861, the former leader of the Midewakatans was begging for food from settlers in the big woods. Cutworms had destroyed most of the corn crop at Redwood and Yellow Medicine. Even Farmer Dakota were going hungry that winter. Teoyate Duta knew the Indian agent wouldn't open his warehouse to blanket Dakota. He and his villagers spent the winters in the woods doing their best not to starve. Teoyate Duta may have hoped that the newly elected president, Abraham Lincoln, would be generous to the Dakota. The leader saw changes brought by the new administration as soon as he reached Redwood that spring. But the changes weren't for the better. In place of Joseph Brown, Lincoln appointed a new agent, Thomas J. Galbraith, a Republican. If Teoyate Duta had disliked Brown's policies, he had never disliked the man. But Thomas Galbraith was a hard man to like, stubborn in his ways and unwilling to see things from another person's point of view. Galbraith was also inexperienced. He had few dealings with Indians before, but he was eager to turn Dakota men into farmers. In 1861, Galbraith made it known that only those Dakota who stayed year-round on the reservations would be receiving annuities that summer, even though all the treaties said otherwise. Under Galbraith's policy, simply being a Dakota no longer gave one the right to annuity payment. Galbraith's policies 
could not help but divide the Dakota. The worst trouble seemed to be at Yellow Medicine. There, fewer Dakota had become farmers. Many still hunted buffalo and lived most of the year on the plains. They came to Yellow Medicine for the annuity payment each summer and then left. But soon, some were staying on the reservation. They stayed just long enough to try to scare De Farmer Dakota. Some killed oxen used to plow fields. Some tore down fences. Others insisted that Farmer Dakota share food stored in their root cellars. At Redwood, farmers were also harassed, but things seemed calmer on the surface. Since Teo e Ate Duta had returned to the reservation in 1858, each spring he had asked government farmers to plow fields for his wives to farm. He and his family lived in a two-story wooden cabin, though he still kept a teepee in the yard. Teo Yate Duta might have seemed content, but he foresaw a dark future for his people. Up to now, most blanket Dakota had managed to avoid starvation on their annuity and whatever they could earn by hunting and trapping. When game was hard to find, or while they awaited the arrival of the annuity each summer, they bought food on credit at the trader's stores. Most bought more than they could pay back. Most were hopelessly in debt. Sarah Wakefield, whose husband took a job as a doctor at Yellow Medicine in 1861, recalled the scene between traders and the Dakota at that summer's annuity payment. Indians would buy on credit, promising to pay at the time of payment. They had no way of keeping accounts, so the traders have their own way at the time of payment. All the Indians are counted, every person giving his name, each band by themselves. At the time of payment, they are called by name from the window to receive their money, which was only nine dollars to each person. As soon as they received it, the traders surround them, saying you owe me so much for flour. Another says you owe me so much for sugar, etc. And the Indian gives it all up, never knowing whether it is right or not. Many Indians pay for the payment with furs. Still, they are caught up by these traders and very seldom a man passes away with his money. I saw one poor fellow one day swallow his money. I wondered he did not choke to death, but he said, They will not have mine, for I do not owe them. Teo Yate Duta could still remember a time when traders like Henry Sibley had been his friends. He believed that the new traders were too harsh in their dealings with the Dakota. They seemed only interested in money not friendship. They didn't understand the Dakota way of looking at debts. The Dakota thought, as one hunter put it, that the traders ought not to be too hard on them about the payments, but do as the Indians did among one another, and put off the payment until they were better able to make it. By the spring of 1862, many Dakota who kept to traditional ways were starving. Many too would ask the traders to extend more credit than they could possibly repay well before the annuity came. Teo Yate Duta himself was taking a second look at some of the Wasichu ways he had always scorned. That summer, he began attending the mission church on Sundays. The minister there was hopeful that Teo Yate Duta would become a Christian. Teo Yate Duta also began digging a cellar at the site of the new brick house that was to be built for him as leader. He had not yet become a farmer. As usual, his wives tended fields plowed by reservation workers. He had not yet cut his hair. But he sometimes wore his fancy Wasichu suit and white gloves. Watching Teo Yate Duta that summer, reservation officials might have thought the former leader was finally warming up to the idea of becoming a farmer. But when traders cut off credit to most blanket Dakota that summer, and the annuity payment was late, young Dakota men talked with Teo Yate Duta. He listened sympathetically to their complaints, pleased that the young men thought he could help, but there was nothing he could do. At Yellow Medicine, some Dakota held a protest when the annuity was late. Others, hungry and impatient, broke into the warehouse. Lieutenant Timothy Sheehan from nearby Fort Ridgely, just down the Minnesota River from Redwood, managed to keep the break-in from turning into a war. 
he also persuaded the Dakota to talk with the agent and traders. Teoyate Duta was there. He listened to Agent Galbraith, who insisted that the food in the warehouse shouldn't be given out until the annuity money arrived. When pressed, Galbraith admitted that he didn't know when the money might come. It was weeks late already, and the U.S. government had bigger problems to deal with. Hundreds of miles from Yellow Medicine and Redwood, southern and northern states were fighting each other in the Civil War. Who knew how long it might take for the government to send the annuity? Teo Yateduta had a suggestion. We have no food, but here are the stores filled with food, he said, motioning towards the trading post. He then turned to Galbraith. We ask that you, the agent, make some arrangement by which we can get food from the stores. Teo Yateduta knew Galbraith could pay the traders back from the annuity money when it arrived. To force a decision, the leader added, We may take up our own way to keep from starving. When men are hungry, they help themselves. But Galbraith couldn't make up his mind. He asked the traders what they thought. Finally, Andrew Merrick, who had already closed his stores to Blanket Dakota that August, rose to leave. On his way out, he said, As far as I'm concerned, if they are hungry, let them eat grass. Teo Yateduta heard the trader add another comment that if they didn't like grass, they should eat their own dung. Merrick's remarks stung. The trader's main concern was getting paid, not making sure that the Dakota had food to eat. But Teo Yateduta and many other Dakota knew that Merrick wasn't too far from the truth. That August, as thousands of Dakota waited for the annuity payment, all their hunting and trapping and fishing scoured the land around the reservations for food. As one woman remembered, when some Dakota were given dry corn, were so near starvation that they ate it raw like cattle. Eating uncooked grain leads to diarrhea. A whole village with diarrhea could create a desperate situation. They could not wait to cook it, the woman went on, and it affected them in such a manner that they were obliged to remove their camp to a clean spot of the earth. Those Dakota were lucky. Others tried to live on green raspberries, wild turnips, and marsh grasses. Lieutenant Sheehan's commander, Captain John Marsh, arrived at Yellow Medicine. He realized that Galbraith and the traders weren't going to hand over food unless they were forced. He ordered Galbraith to open the warehouse. For a while, at least, Dakota at Yellow Medicine wouldn't starve. Before leaving Yellow Medicine, Teo Yateduta asked Galbraith to do the same at Redwood. After all, his people were hungry too. Galbraith agreed. But when he came to the reservation on August 15th, Galbraith did nothing to ease the hunger there. Instead, he was looking for Dakota men and men of both Dakota and white backgrounds. He was asking any man he could find to join the Union Army and fight in the distant Civil War. Galbraith soon left with a group of recruits headed for St. Paul. The agent probably did not know that the Dakota at Redwood were recruiting soldiers of their own. They had formed a soldier's lodge, usually formed to keep order on long hunting trips. A soldier's lodge was also used to keep order during war. In the summer of 1862, the Soldier's Lodge was a place for young Dakota men angry with traders, upset with white settlers, and hungry for food to gather. And it was just the place where a group of young hunters would go when trouble arose between the Dakota and the settlers.